What's going on, Quest Teens? Good evening. God bless you. Thank you so much for joining us. Super excited about this series that we're embarking on titled Enough. Enough. And as you can see, those little chess pieces on the screen uh, right under the title, uh, there's a reason why we're going to go into that. But it's a series about family. Yes, family. Not only our blood family, which we have our ups and downs with and we have our tension with every so often, but we also have great memories and, and happy, joyful moments with, but also our uh, fellow brothers and sisters in the faith, right? Because the Bible says that they're our family uh, as well. Um, and if we're honest, our relationship with our families can sometimes feel a little bit like a way too competitive game night. With our families, sometimes it's fun, but other times we might fight for first place gang up on each other, betray each other, and walk away with frustration and hurt feelings. If you've ever played a game night with your family, and I pray that you have, it's a great, it's just great memory. It's a great childhood memory that I have. I'm a little older than a lot of you, but if you haven't experienced a game night with the family, set it up, get everybody together, throw a bunch of games on the table and just go at it and play. And it's loving and it's fun, but it's also crazy and competitive, like family relationships can sometimes be. See, families can be sources of joy and laughter, but also stress and tension. That's that dynamic, you know? We laugh with our family, we cry with them, we're joyful, but at the same time, they drive us a little crazy. And we love them so much that when things do get a little stressful and tense, it almost magnifies that emotion times 10. But what if our families could be places where we could all help each other win? In this four-week series from the New Testament, we'll look at how the earliest followers of Jesus created a new kind of community as God's family. Not only were there blood family within the body of Christ, but also people that used to be complete strangers, that all of a sudden two people that were complete strangers committed to Jesus, and they became like a family as well. I want to title this small devotional, short devotional, There is Enough When We Share What We Have. There is enough when we share what we have. Man, a family game night, as I mentioned, gets a little crazy sometimes. And I'm going to go through a couple of roles. And you tell me if you know anybody in your family like this. There's the one person that reads all the rules. You know that one? That you just play, you just flow, you're going. But all of a sudden something happens and they go back to the instruction pamphlet. And they're like, no, no, we have to play it this way. And they go line by line reading the rules. Technically, that's what the rules are for. But most of us don't read them. But there's the one family member in game night that reads all the rules and reminds us how everything goes. What about the one who seems to win no matter what happens? <laughs> I don't know if they're cheating. I don't know what they're doing. But they always come out on top. They always happen to be very good at the games. What about this one? Maybe this is you. Sometimes this is me. I can't lie. What about the one that we would call a sore loser if they lose? That means if they lose, there's always an excuse they don't congratulate the person. They don't say good job. There's no high five. There's no dap. There's no fist bump. It's like you lost. It's like I lost and I'm not happy about it. You know, that's a sore loser. I'm like that sometimes. Finally, what about the one that's competitive at all costs? That no matter what, they try to win. No matter what, they try to hoard the game. No matter what, they just try to come out on top, even if they had to stomp all over you to do it. And a lot of times, man, there's a lot of board games that the point is to stomp on your opponent. We're going to go into that in a little bit, and I'm going to talk about a specific board game. But first, let me go into Scripture. And this Scripture is going to be almost like the opposite of what we're talking about, this competitive game night nature. And this is, we found this Scripture in the book of Acts, chapter 4, verses 32 through 35. Acts 4, 32 through 35. This is the scripture I'm about to read is the very, very beginning of the early church. Jesus had just ascended back into heaven. He let he, the Holy Spirit is now within the believers and they're trying to figure life out together. And we're going to see how they just came together as a family and together as a family. And they did one specific thing that stands out and it's sharing. And I'm going to read what it says. The subtitle says the believers share their possessions. Verse 32 says all the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything that they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no, verse 34, that there were no needy persons among them. 
For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to anyone who had need. That's powerful. That scripture is biblical, yet kind of weird, because if we're honest, we don't really live like this, you know? These people were so in love with Jesus that nothing else mattered. They just came, and those that had possessions and material goods was like, here, I have plenty to share with everyone. I don't care anymore. I don't care about this stuff. I'm just willing to give it all and put it all at the apostles' feet, and you guys distribute it to all that has need, that, all the people that have need. There's a specific game that I mentioned earlier, or that I said I'm going to mention, and th the game that I'm talking about is Monopoly. <laughs> Anybody ever heard of Monopoly? It's the most famous board game, the number one selling board game in the history of the United States. Um, maybe the history of the world as well. But let me tell you something about the early church. They would have been very bad at playing Monopoly. <laughs> they wouldn't have been very good at playing Monopoly, right? Why? Because Monopoly, the whole point of Monopoly is to literally gain, gain, gain more possessions, have more than everyone, take from everybody else so you can have more, so you could win. That's the whole point of Monopoly. Monopoly is the most successful board game in history. Although popular, I'm pretty sure that it starts more fights than it actually brings families together. I don't know why it's the most selling, the top selling board game. It's a great board game, but man, it starts some tension. It brings some tension to the family uh, game nights, no doubt about that. But why? Because to win Monopoly, you have to collect more than anyone else. See, it's not, just about, it's not that you're collecting more, it's that you're taking from everyone else. That never goes well when you take from everyone else. Here, give me your this, give me that. Send people to jail in a Monopoly game. Transactions and negotiations help, but to give away is to fail. That's the key. In Monopoly, when you give, you fail. When you give, you lose because it's all about hoarding. It's all about give me more, 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 more. I need more than you. I have to give, I have to have, 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 and I have to take, 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 take. That attitude did not work according to the scripture that we just read. The early church was literally the opposite of Monopoly, where they were willing to just give away as much as they can. They were willing to share as much as they can. They were willing to say, here, you're my family, I love you. Here, what's mine is yours. You remember that saying? <laughs> you remember that? Was the last time somebody who said that? I mean, what I grew up with was popular. What's mine is yours. I don't remember the last, now that I think about it, I don't remember the last person that told me, what's mine is yours. I gotta talk to my wife. I don't, remember, I don't even know if she said that to me. <laughs> But what's mine is yours. The last time you heard somebody say that, the early church literally believed this. They lived this out. They practiced what they preached. You know what's mine? They literally believed what's mine is yours. I don't care anymore. I love you so much because we have Jesus in common and he calls us to just like follow him wholeheartedly and I got to just give because God put it in my heart to give. See, the verses we just read in Acts show us that God's spirit makes it possible to live differently than this. Then what? Then monopoly. God doesn't compel us through guilt, scarcity, and negotiations, but through joy and abundance. The family of God is the total opposite of monopoly. And these people weren't miserable. We got to understand that these people weren't like, oh man, here, I guess I got to give you my house. Here, I really want to keep this, but uh, here, I guess you're, you're forcing me to give you and to sell my possessions. This was the attitude that these people had. They were like, here, they just like, here, I don't care what it is. I'll give you because I have plenty. And there was one scripture that Jesus talked about in Matthew chapter 13 that I feel like brings all of this together. What would possibly compel a believer to just give everything away? What would possibly compel a believer to want to share everything that they have? I'm going to show you. I'm going to read the scripture right now. Matthew 13, 44 through 46 says this. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy went and sold all that he had and bought that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything that he had and bought it. It's interesting because the parallel that Jesus says, when he talks about the kingdom of heaven, he's talking about salvation. He's talking about finding him, finding a relationship with him, with Jesus himself. And when you really come to Christ and he changes you, everything else becomes secondary. See, and it, and it makes the example of somebody that finds this great treasure, this true treasure, this eternal treasure that the material goods don't matter anymore. See, the Bible says in his joy, he went out and sold everything that he had. 
It wasn't under, he wasn't forced to do it. He gladly did it because he found Jesus and nothing else matters. And when you come to Christ, nothing else matters. See, it's weird when we think about people giving away their possessions in the early church. But you got to understand in the context of it that they found something much greater, that their possessions meant nothing to them anymore. I don't care about money anymore. I don't care about my house. I don't care about this stuff because I found true riches in God. And again, that parable or that story that Jesus says that it's like that man, that treasure was so valuable that they went out, sold everything that they had just so they can focus on this treasure. See, in other scripture, God says that where your treasure is, that's where your heart is also. So yeah, maybe you're you're a little stingy and you don't want to give things away. You're like, oh, you know, I'm holding on to this. Well, then pay attention to really what you value. You value that stuff more than maybe those around you. You value your things more than your family. It's possible because that's what you're saying by acting that way. I'm going to end with this specific scripture. And we find it in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 to 8. And it says this. The subtitle says, Generosity Encouraged. Remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves the cheerful giver, and God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. God is so awesome. He's so faithful that he even promise you whatever, promises you whatever you give away is somehow you're going to get back double. That's where the scripture comes from. You reap what you sow. What you give is what you get back and then some. When you do it according to God's purpose, which is what you do it joyfully, you do it because riches don't even mean that much to you. Material goods don't even mean that much to you. And go figure that that's the person that God ends up blessing. When it means nothing to you, God gives you an abundance. When that's all you care about, be careful. Things get a little dangerous. So my prayer for all of you is that, you know what? We practice what we preach. That we love God and value him so much that we're willing to share not only with our blood family, but with our family of believers. Start small. Maybe you could share your time. Maybe you could share your PlayStation 5. I don't know what it is. But start small. But don't be so attached to all these things that you're just hoarding them and holding on to them like, oh, no, I can't get you this. I can't let you borrow this. Be careful with that. That's a dangerous position to be in because you're valuing stuff and things. You're worshiping created things rather than the creator. Let me pray with you as you work on just being a joyful and cheerful giver, not only this week, but this month. Lord, I thank you so much for this message, this double-edged sword called your word that always comes timely. I thank you because you're the God of everything and you give us in abundantly. And just like you give us, your hope and for us is that we can give cheerfully and to connect with our family by just giving and sharing. Even if we have a little, we share what we have and you always bring it back. I pray that you may break the yoke of those that maybe treasure material things more than they or we should. Because at the end of the day, it's not about created things. It's about the creator, and that's you. And when we do that, we're going to see your spirit at work within us and those around us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. God bless you guys. Have a great week.